We're going to talk about fertility hormones, what they are and what they do. Um, we've been, if you've been following us on naturalfertilityinfo.com, we've been taking a step back from some of the more um, super, how do I say this? We've been trying to step back and readdress some of the foundational things that people can do on their fertility journey to support their fertility, health, and reproductive wellness. And we've been trying to um, simplify steps to take even a little bit more and readdress some things that we've talked about in the past um, and um, talk about them again in perhaps a, a shorter, more concise way and a more simple way, or just bringing them back up so that they're in your awareness as you continue on your journey. Because there are a lot of things that are really simple and affordable and easy and that you can be doing daily. And that's what I've talked about in the past if you go to our archives or what we are talking about on our informational website. And this Periscope fits in that as well. Um, I think that we forget about the synergy between our hormones, particularly our primary fertility hormones. And I just wanna go back, step back and talk about what those hormones are and why we need them and what they do for us. And then I have three really common questions that I'm gonna answer at the very end of this uh, talk. If you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to us through either website. We've got contact us forms in the upper right hand corners of both of them. You're, um, please reach out to us. We'll get you to information that will hopefully answer your questions and or answer them with you and for you or guide you to information that will be helpful. So again, uh, fertility hormones, what they are and what they do. So you all probably know this, but if you don't, our hormones are chemical messengers in our bodies. We all have them. We all have them in different ratios, but we've all got them. They communicate with and among throughout the body systems um, and give each other energy. They give us energy. They work to help boost our mood, control our insulin levels and our hunger, keep us warm, regulate our menstrual cycles, including our periods and ovulation. Um, they work to help us grow hair and bones and to help us sleep and wake in a cycle. Um, they cause us to be calm and they also cause us to have that flight or fright response to something uh, that scares us. They help us stay pregnant when we do get pregnant. They help us make breast milk and they help that breast milk come in when uh, you begin breastfeeding and so much more. That was all kind of more around female fertility, um, but hormones obviously do a lot for men as well. Um, I kind of missed libido in that list. They're very important for helping us um, have sexual energy or our libido. And you'll hear a little bit more about that too as we go on. So what are these hormones? You've heard of estrogen. I'm certain that you have. Uh, perhaps you've learned that yours is high or low or it's been in any number of informational articles you've read about fertility health and reproductive wellness. But estrogen is, a, is the main female sex hormone. It's very important for we women. It's responsible for regulating and stimulating for fertility. It's the reason why we grow um, breasts and, and um, develop as women. Um, estrogen is essential for healthy bone formation, um, healthy gene expression, maintaining healthy cholesterol levels, um, and formation of those secondary sexual characteristics, you know, pubic hair, breasts, et cetera, those things that identify us as female. And um, estradiol, you've probably heard of that in relation to estrogen, but estradiol is vital for a healthy menstrual cycle. It is most active in the follicular phase, so that first part of your menstrual cycle from when your period starts until ovulation. That's when it's most abundant and most active within us and should be um, when we're healthy and when everything's balanced, right? The other hormone I'm certain you've heard about is progesterone. Uh, every woman needs progesterone. It's another major female hormone. Uh, it helps to regulate the menstrual cycle. Um, adequate levels are vital for proper fallopian tube function. Uh, it prepares the body for conception and plays a ro role in maintaining pregnancy. Uh, supports a developing em embryo at that stage at, um, if you do conceive. Progesterone is needed for healthy libido, bone formation again, proper blood clotting, and it signals the release of insulin playing a role in our, in our susceptibility for um, insulin resistance or diabetes. It helps maintain insulin levels, hopefully we don't get to that point. But um, diabetes and insulin resistance are um, something that a lot of women with PCOS deal with. And uh, progesterone also works to balance the effects of estrogen. It is most active after ovulation through the luteal phase. That is when your progesterone levels will be at their highest and should be at their highest. Um, at ovulation, when the egg is released, there is a remnant egg sac that produces progesterone for you through the luteal phase. 
and into pregnancy should you conceive naturally until the placenta takes over progesterone production in pregnancy. Um, follicle stimulating hormone is another important female hormone. It regulates the body's development, growth, and maturation throughout our fertile years, reproductive processes, many of them, and signals that follicle that I just mentioned in the ovary to mature to prepare for ovulation. Um, FSH is important for that. Luteinizing hormone, or LH. Um, an LH surge is responsible for triggering ovulation and development of that corpus luteum that will go on to produce progesterone through your luteal phase for you. Um, FSH and LH work synergistically together to make that process happen and, and um, the luteal phase continue on. Testosterone. Um, testosterone, of course, is the main male sex hormone, but it, we also have it as women. Um, testosterone is responsible for um, libido, sex drive for both sexes, energy levels, and for bone building for both of us as well. We obviously, as women, don't have as much as men, um, but when testosterone levels are elevated or too low, uh, women can have um, a variety of different um, side effects of that, if you will, like um, hair growth in places where we normally don't grow it along the jawline, um, on chests, or hair loss, male pattern hair baldness and hair loss can happen too when testosterone levels are um, out of whack. Next, prolactin. Prolactin is an important hormone um, for stimulating breast milk production during pregnancy and for inducing lactation after the baby is born, after giving birth. Um, prolactin becomes a problem prior to conception or in the absence of pregnancy. Uh, it can, if it's too elevated, lead to infertility or be, be a reason why you're not conceiving naturally. Um, it can cause decreased libido in both men and women among a myriad of other gender specific issues. Um, we've got all those listed out on naturalfertilityinfo.com on an article about um, hyperprolactinemia, which is the fancy technical term for when your prolactin is too high. So if you're thinking that's the case or you're dealing with that, you can go to that article to um, learn the ways that extra prolactin in the absence of pregnancy presents in men and women. Um, if I were to have listed them all out, this might take an extra 10 minutes. There's quite a list. Uh, what else should we talk about? Cortisol. I think cortisol is a really important hormone to talk about because it helps regulate metabolism and blood sugar, um, aids in our fat, protein, and carbohydrate metabolism. It can suppress, actually, the immune system and inflammation. Um, obviously, we sometimes don't want a suppressed immune system. Um, most of the time don't want that, but there are cases where, um, anyway, I'm going to stop there. We can go a little bit more into that if you have questions and reach out to us about cortisol levels. Anyway, cortisol also helps regulate blood pressure, uh, fuels our flight or fright response and instinct and helps control our sleep-wake cycle. So it's really important to have, um, to maintain healthy stress levels and have your adrenal glands be healthy throughout this journey so that you're not dealing with, um, you know, sleep cycles that are really poor, you're not getting great sleep, you're waking a lot, or you're constantly stressed and in that heightened state of um, flight or fright. Those aren't helpful. I think also worthy of noting in this conversation is um, anti-malarian hormone or AMH. Uh, I have venture a guess that the majority of the women on here now or who will be watching this have heard of AMH levels at some point and you will as you continue to get older, particularly in, in and through your 40s on this journey. Um, AMH levels are indicative or used to determine ovarian reserve, meaning the number of eggs in an ovary. Um, AMH for a long time has been solely used to determine ovarian reserve, but there's actually a new, there's a new idea that it shouldn't be used alone, that if you're going to have AMH levels tested, it might also be very helpful to have uh, an ultrasound of the ovaries so that the technician can actually count the follicles that he or she sees. Um, you would want to talk to your doctor about that, whether or not he or she thinks that that's tr um, true for you or necessary for you. Um, but AMH does not determine egg health. Know that. So if you've had an AMH test and you have a result that's not as hopeful as you wanted, um, it doesn't determine the health of the eggs that are in the ovaries. And it doesn't, um, it may give you an idea of chances of conception, sort of, um, but it really is just a number. It doesn't mean that um, conception can't happen by any means. There's kind of a negative connotation around AMH, but I want to talk about it because I know a lot of women have that tested. 
particularly, like I said, as they move through their fertile years. So the hormones, again, are estrogen, progesterone, follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH, luteinizing hormone, or LH, testosterone, prolactin, cortisol, and I talked about anti-malarian hormone, or AMH, as well. So the questions that I mentioned in the beginning that we get a lot that I want to talk about because it happens, and, and they're, they're common questions, right? Um, we often get asked what ranges should each hormone be in ideally, or my level is this, insert number, is that good or bad? Um, it, hormone level tests and results will be different for everyone. There are ideal ranges, but this truly depends upon each woman where she as in her, is at in her cycle when testing happens, what lab is reporting the results, and or what your healthcare practitioner feels is good or not good, adequate, right? Your healthcare love practitioner may have uh, a little bit different range than a different healthcare practitioner. It seems strange, I know, but there are a lot of ranges for hormone level tests. There's really no magic number. You know, we don't have a magic number um, because fertility truly really is about hormones interacting with each other and that balance um, resulting in how we feel overall. So if you have hormone testing and you hear um, my estrogen is this number, it's also very important to think about all that number in relation to all of the other hormones as well. And your doctor is, or your healthcare provider, if you've chosen to go the natural road, is really the best one to help you interpret that and understand in the context of what you're going through in your health. Um, so it's important to really talk to your doctor. Um, the next question we get often is how and when should hormones be tested? So there are saliva, blood, and urine tests for hormones. Your doctor is going to tell you the one that he or she relies on most. Um, if you're interested in another, you need to have that conversation. Um, there are many different, several different times of the cycle to have hormones tested since hormones change throughout the cycle. Um, oftentimes, for example, progesterone is tested on cycle day 21 because that's when it should be near its peak for you. Um, so anyway, your doctor or your healthcare provider, whomever you're working with, whether natural or medical, is going to be able to help you know when to best test hormones. Um, one important note, a very important note, and I just touched on this, it's extremely important to have your doctor or qualified healthcare practitioner explain what your test results mean for you in the context of your fertility journey and your overall health. You've got to do that. There are so many tests you can get online. You can get, um, I, I could send a saliva test in right now if I had one, <laughs> and have it tested, have my hormones um, measured through my saliva by a company and that whole report sent back to me. I'm not trained to read that and understand it in its entirety. And I know that a lot of you aren't either. So it's extremely important to have help in understanding what the test results mean for you in context of your health. I'm just gonna say it again, it's important. And the last question, what does it mean for fertility when hormone XYZ is out of balance, high or low, whatever that might be? Um, in short, to be frank, it means there's work to be done. Um, your hormones will shift throughout your menstrual cycle. Your hormones are gonna wax and wane as you age. As we women get older, um, many say it starts at like age 35, particularly 40 and over up to 50 and even beyond. Um, our hormones are meant to shift. They naturally will shift and wax and wane and, and cycles may become irregular and that's all like the natural design of the way our bodies were made to work. Um, so if you're young and you have a hormonal imbalance, there's work to be done. It's, um, you know, there might be natural therapies to help you support a return to balance. In fact, we know that they work in that way. That's what, why our company exists. But it's gonna be helpful to us if you want our help for you to figure out what's leading to that imbalance. So having the testing, talking to your doctor about what the test results mean for you, and then asking and thinking and doing detective work to figure out why it's out of whack why something's out of balance, what, what caused that? Could it be stress? Could it be my diet? Could have been, it been my exposure to something throughout my um, working days or my career? Um, could it be that I don't exercise, that I'm sedentary, that I'm perhaps overweight or underweight? You know, there's all sorts of reasons why hormones become imbalanced, um, excess stress, obviously. Um, so it's really important to sit down, take a step back, just a, a little, little step back, 
and be detective and think about why things are imbalanced. And that's going to help whatever practitioner you use or choose to work with, or all of them if you have a team, um, create a plan that's going to benefit you most and help your body return back to its happy state, its state of balance at some point. Uh, I, I know this was maybe a step back and kind of basic for some of you, and I know that this will be new information for others of you. So if you want more information on any of this, we have a fantastic guide that details it all in several pages. Um, I like to refer back to our guides, but I am in charge of what we publish and I'm very proud of it. So um, go to that information. It's all free on naturalfertilityinfo.com. And um, we are certainly happy to answer questions or guide you to information if you can't find exactly what you're looking for. So thank you for joining me today. Uh, again, thank you to all replay viewers. I hope this was helpful and I hope that you have a fantastic weekend. Uh, we'll see you next week. My plan is to come back next Thursday. All right, take care.